I'm Jill Powers. I'm a consultant pharmacist. I work with Pharmerica. Um, I'm based out of their Warwick office and I've been there for just about 26 years. Um, I graduated from URI a very long time ago. Um, it was December of 1989 and it was when we had a five-year program. And uh, believe it or not, I actually was able to do it in four and a half years. So that was great. I, I finished up um, December 23rd at 4.30 was my last exam and December 24th, Christmas Eve and December 25th, I was working as a graduate pharmacist at Miriam Hospital. Wow. So I jumped right into it and it was Christmas. So no one cared that I graduated college. Then. Um, I actually did skip graduation in May, which I know is not very good. We should all be going to our graduation. Um, but by then I had been working as a pharmacist and I was getting married and building a house and um, just had too many things going on. So in my early years, I worked at Miriam Hospital um, and I worked for several retail stores, some little, some big. I very quickly became a district manager for a small chain and found out that I really don't like management um and got back into the clinical world after i had my son in 1995. um i did do some work i was an adjunct professor down at uri i taught um pharmacy tech uh technician training program at ccri and did that for a couple of years um that was really interesting because it was uh 18 to 64 year olds and it was through the Department of Workforce Force and Training. And it was during a time when we were trying to get more people who were, there were a lot of people laid off. Um, that was probably one of the most challenging things of trying to teach for four hours to a uh, group of people from that large of an age group. There was, everyone did math a different way and it was quite a challenge. So currently I'm a consultant pharmacist. Um, I still try to do some education I um, really now work with med techs in the state, um, not in their initial training, but more in their training once they're out in the world, because they have a very short period of time that they learn everything they're supposed to know to pass meds. And then they're out in the world. And I feel like it's up to people like me to help them learn more about disease states and why they're giving a particular drug or why if they hold that drug, why it's such a bad thing. So I do love to continue um, in the education field. I'm a preceptor for URI. Um, I like to take the students when I can fit it into my schedule. Um, very often we'll split one between the in-house pharmacist and then I'll take them a couple of days a week. I've had some wonderful students from URI that have come out with me. Uh, it's just hard to fit it all into my schedule and I don't get any sort of leeway in my schedule for doing that. But when I can, I do. So in my role as a consultant pharmacist, I um, go into, I specifically have 10 different facilities in the state of Rhode Island that I go into on a monthly basis. Um, uh, they can range from a 30 bed home to a 200 bed home. Obviously, depending upon the size is how long I'm in there. Pre-COVID, um, I could be in a facility for four days out of the month if it was a large facility. And um, now that COVID has changed that a little bit, usually I'm going into each facility for one day to do the work I need to do while I'm in the facility. Nice. That's great. Um, so you've done a lot of different things, sounds like. You've had a I've lot been of a different pharmacist for a lot of years. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's good that we have you um, included in this because um, a lot of the other pharmacists that I've interviewed are kind of, they're fresh out of school. So it's kind of cool to see how your path has, has changed over the years and how, you know, where you ended up, I guess. So um, did you go through any special training? Did you go, did you have, do a residency or anything like that? Or did you just go right into? We didn't even know what residencies were then. I think yeah. there were a few of them. Yeah. Um, so no particular special training. I got a wonderful education at URI. Uh, we did our rotations. You guys all have fancy names for them now. Back then it was just pharmacy rotations. And one of the rotations I did was with a pharmacist named Pauline Roy 
And she, part of it was um, a long-term care facility in Fall River and also Elmhurst Extended Care. That's actually one of my homes now. And I loved it. Um, it was a very different part of pharmacy that I had never even heard of. So I was really glad that I was able to get involved in it. So when I went and worked at the hospital, which I also loved, um, I worked in retail um, just as a staff pharmacist. I was floating mostly because I did both jobs because I really liked the clinical when I first got out, but I really liked the pay of the retail pharmacy. So I combined those two jobs and um, really like the clinical part of it. Uh, when I got into the business part, I really didn't like that part at all. And I think back then they didn't teach us a whole lot about business back then, unless you were gonna own a pharmacy. We had a lot of independent pharmacies back in that day. So I learned a lot, that was a lot on the fly. I learned a lot of things you shouldn't do. <laughs> um, it was interesting, but I really wanted to get back into the clinical part of it. And one of the reasons I chose consulting was a lot of it was for the flexibility. I had worked in a retail pharmacy where back in the day, you know, you just did not use the bathroom in eight or 12 hours because there was nobody there. You couldn't leave the pharmacy. So I'm very happy to see they've changed that. Um, and working as a consultant gave me a lot of flexibility. I was a new mom. My son is now 26, married, um, and I wanted to spend the time with my family. That was really important to me. So I was able to work. At one point, I think I was working three days a week, and those three days were very flexible. So I was able to flex them around swim meets and baseball schedules and anything else. Um, today, the flexibility in my schedule is what keeps me at this job. I love to travel. And I am able to travel um, when there's not a pandemic. About once a week, once a month, I go away for a week, at least a long weekend. And because I don't have to be anywhere at any specific time, unless I have a, a, a scheduled meeting, which we usually know months in advance, then I can just work around it. So I can work a weekend or work some very long days and then take some time off. And being able to travel has been really important. Um, I actually went last year to Australia and Vietnam and Singapore, and I did a month vacation, which obviously I had to take vacation time for, but it was very easy for me to work it around my schedule. Uh, yep. Oh, I didn't have anything. <laughs> you can keep going. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, I like to travel, that's why I do this job. <laughs> Yeah, I feel like that's important to do what it you really is. It's good to have a, a home work life balance. And um, I love my job. I love what I do. And I don't know I would be saying that if I were um, working in more of a traditional pharmacy job. Mm -hmm. So I don't, you know, I could retire. You know, we've talked about retiring. Uh, but I don't think I'll ever get out of it. I have homes and patients and nurses who have said, you're not leaving. And I'm like, no, 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 I'll stay. Um, and maybe it'll look like that I'm only working what would be equivalent to most people one day a week, but it would be four days a month. And, and maybe that would be in the middle of the month and I continue to travel. Or if my son and his new wife are blessed with children, then I would like to be watching my grandchildren. So it started out being flexible for me to be able to go to my son's swim meets and may turn into flexibility for me to be with my grandchildren, yet still stay in the field and uh, still be helping people. Um, I did an interview recently, um, maybe it was last year now, um, for one of the corporations that we work with and uh, people were kind of laughing afterwards, but I said, for the most part, almost every day, I really feel like I've either saved someone's life or made a significant difference to make it better. And there's not many jobs you can say that in. And that's what really um, keeps me going. And part of that is transition of care. Um, seeing people go from home to a hospital, to a long-term care facility, maybe back to the hospital in between that, back to the long-term care facility, maybe a different long-term care facility, and then home, everyone's making their list of meds. And even with computerized systems, 
you would think it would be easier and we wouldn't mess them up. Um, but sadly, the number of medication errors are really significant. And I feel like um, being able to catch those errors, being able to make sure that someone who was in a hospital just recently um, went into a hospital for CHF, was started on some high dose Lasix, they had to stop it because of his kidney function. He came to the facility, nowhere on his COC form was there Lasix. But um, if you read in between, you know, don't lift anything more than 15 pounds and blah, 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 it had resume Lasix on Wednesday. Well, nobody picked that up and, and I can kind of see why they didn't. It was way down at the bottom of the page, but because I know he went to the hospital for CHF, I know, well, what are we doing about, you know, talked about his kidney function. Well, what do we give him and what are we gonna give him now? Um, you know, we were able to save him a hospital visit and a lot of discomfort and that sort of things. So those are the things that I do in a day that, you know, make me want to go back again the next day. <laughs> yeah, that was a great story that you told, because I feel like that's, you know, that's the goal is to just make a difference. And, you know, that's why we go into pharmacy is be for those moments and to to kind of make a difference even if it's just something something small that seems small but it actually becomes something big so um how do you feel like you or i prepared you for this role you or i well um the biggest thing is my rotations it was getting me out in the field to see that this was something that was out there um again i had no idea I went to pharmacy school because I wanted to go to medical school and my chemistry teacher in high school said, well, if you can't afford to go to medical school right now, why don't you consider going to pharmacy school and then work your way through medical school as a pharmacist? And I thought that was brilliant. And I went through pharmacy school and started working with the doctors. And this was back when I had to work 72 hours straight without sleep. I don't know who ever thought that was a good idea. Um, and you know, when it came to medication, I realized I knew a heck of a lot more than they did. So I decided that this was going to give me a lot of flexibility in my life to be able to have a nice work-life balance, um, raise a family, and still take care of people. Yeah, definitely. I feel like a lot of um, a lot of my classmates have decided to go on after pharmacy school and go to med school. Not a lot of them, but a, a few of them. And it's just I mean, the good for them, it's just so much schooling after. So I don't know. I don't think I could do it. <laughs> Apparently I didn't. <laughs> and I don't regret it at all. I don't, I never, once I decided I didn't want to do it, I did not want to do it. Yeah. I, I really feel, you know, and I think, you know, I've been working for 26 years in the same, some of them in the same facilities. Um, believe it or not, some of my patients have been the same. Some of the people who were much younger, um, a lot of the same doctors I've been working with, uh, the nurses kind of bounce around, maybe they're in this facility and then they leave and I miss them and then they show up somewhere else. And it's always wonderful. You, those connections that you have made and people trust you. I feel like, you know, I have a very good reputation. I, um, make good recommendations. The doctors really appreciate what I'm doing. Um, to be honest, when I first started consulting, I wrote a recommendation to a doctor and his response was, when you get MD after your name, um, then you can talk to me. And, uh, you know, I was new to consulting. So I took his letter and I walked down, found out where he was. He was actually at the hospital next door and I walked over to the hospital. And I said, so I'm not gonna get MD after my name, but let's talk about this. And, uh, you know, we, we've had a pretty good working relationship since then, but, you know, that was not a very nice thing he said to me. Right, and honestly, I think that's really important for us to realize when, I mean, those of us that are going into the field, just entering the field is we're probably gonna have a lot of that, um, you know, the, um, you know, comments like that, that just don't, build our confidence and don't give us a reason to, you know, want to <laughs> want to keep doing what we're doing. But um, I think that's important that you addressed it like that and was, and now you have a good relationship with them. So. And I also think um, 
well, now you guys are all graduating with PharmDs. So I'm still a registered pharmacist, RPH after my name. And did think about going back to get my PharmD. I think that started when I was teaching down there and um, they offered that to me. And I love to learn, but I hate to take tests. <laughs> so I decided I wouldn't do that. Um, as far as, you know, I still, I got a call the other day from somebody and I said, I don't know the answer. Um, I say, I don't know often because I don't know. Um, or I'm not sure, or this is what I think it is, but don't quote me on it. Let me get, let me go back and look it up and give you the documentation. So I always follow up with, even if, even if there's a lot of COVID stuff going on right now, and a lot of people are coming to me about the COVID vaccine, because I seem to have gotten very involved in that. And I'll give them the answer, but I'm, I tell them I'm going to follow up with the documentation from it. And I go right to CDC or Rhode Island Department of Health website and I pull the information off and I send it to them. Um, I had a student actually doing a, asked a question. Someone asked me a question. I was busy with vaccinating. I had her give me the answer. Um, I forwarded that to the nurse. And that night when I went home, I reviewed it and I said, uh, I don't like that dose that she recommended. Um, so I sent an email to her and the physician because I wasn't sure if it had gotten that far and just said, I think uh, the information I gave you this morning wasn't right. Um, looking into it some more, this was a dialysis patient. And I said, I, I would rather you start on this dose and evaluate it in a couple of weeks, but it's okay to say you do something wrong. I mean, believe me, we, we do. Yeah. Definitely. And I feel like pharmacy is one of those fields that's just always changing. Anything in medicine really is just always changing and we always have to keep keep on top of the guidelines. There's always new guidelines coming out. So it's definitely, um, I'm sure it's changed a lot in the past 26 years that you've been in the, in the field. So um, how do you see moving, like looking forward, how do you see the role of a long-term care pharmacist evolving? You know, that's such an interesting question. Um, I think this pandemic has really um, made a lot of people look at long-term care in general versus home care. Um, I think the goal should always be to keep people in their home as long as possible. And I don't think we were doing that uh, in the state, in the country. And I think now we're beginning to look at that. When we had the spread, you know, if we have a 50 bed dementia unit and we had COVID on it, how do you stop that? I, I don't, you just can't. I mean, I'm in the facilities, people have their masks on. I'm saying, you know, pull your mask up over your nose. They put it on their head. They put it under their chin. I mean, they just don't understand. Yeah. So you couldn't stop the spread of that. And what's the next virus going to be? Or what's the next thing that's going to, I mean, even flu or norovirus that's in the facilities, it just goes through. So anyway, I digress a little bit there, but um, so I think we're gonna see more home care in general, which I think would be great. Um, I, you're always gonna have your skilled rehab patients, which to me are wonderful. I don't get to know them personally, like I do some of my long-term care people, um, but we're gonna really have to be careful about um, meds coming in and out the transition of care and I know just recently we were having some issues and one of the local hospitals added a pharmacist to the last spot. So before they go out, they get all of their discharge paperwork and there's a pharmacist who's reviewing it. So before it goes out to the long-term care facility, I wish I could say it solved all our problems. It cut down on a lot of our problems. So they were added as an additional step. Um, personally, I would love to see some sort of one system that we could all go into and look up people's meds and history and all of that that would be really ideal. Um, but one of the things I was always in the facility every day. So I would go to this facility and sit at the nursing station and I would be for four days, I would go back to the same facility. And now I'm doing a lot more of it um, from home or at the pharmacy. And I think that that will continue to stay. I think, first of all, I think I'm more productive because I get sidetracked in the facility and the nurses come up or the dietitian comes in who I haven't seen for, you know, six months and we're talking about children or, um, you know, the doctors come up and they have a question and you're just constantly being interrupted. 
So I think that um, although I love being in the facility and involved, as far as trying to streamline therapy, I think being able to do chart reviews from home, from a computer, and then go in for the meetings and spend a day in there. Um, part of my job is doing narcotic audits and med station reviews and nursing education. So with the pandemic, you know, now we're kind of getting to the tail end of this, thank God. Um, I try to schedule all of that in the same day. So I'm still seeing them. I still have the relationship with them. I'm still going to meetings in person, but I can do it all in one day versus, you know, so I think time-wise that's um, much more beneficial. So just to give you an example, um, it would be nice if I could tell you that I get to go in and talk to all of my residents all day long and talk about their medications. But realistically, I'm doing 50 plus chart reviews in a day. So it's hard to go and talk to residents when you're doing that. Fortunately, um, some of my facilities hire me to do new patient reviews. And those I go in, sometimes I talk to the family, I'll talk to the patient, depending upon the situation. So those I get to spend a little bit more time. And then um, in the past few years, we've been doing MTM reviews that we get to spend some time with the patients. When I take students from URI, um, I always have them do the new admission people because they get to spend a lot more time. They get to dig in. If we're in the facility, they get to go talk to the patient and we get a lot more out of it because they get to spend the time. You know, I wish I had more hours in the day to spend talking to the patient rather than looking at a computer screen. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I feel like, well, I did an, I did a rotation at Omnicare, um, I did my IPI there and I just, I, I don't know, I just never really understood long-term care. So I feel like it was cool for me to see that, that perspective, because it is such a different setting, you know, other than retail or just hospital. And so, were you in the facilities? I was, yeah. Which is awesome. Yeah. You know, it, it's been very hard with COVID. Um, I had one student back in I was at Seminar by the Sea when this all started with URI and uh, they weren't sure what they were going to do with their rotations and um, Brett was there and I said yeah I'll just take them like I don't know how many do you have they have to graduate right they got to do something I'll just just we'll just put them somewhere we'll figure it out <laughs> and um, I think we had two or three then but we weren't able to go into the facilities then the next rotation it was summer and, um, you know, we had to get really creative. We had to get creative. Suddenly the conference room at the pharmacy now had to be used to spread out people for break rooms. Um, I uh, met students on the front porch of my house and we sat six feet away and faced outward and it was great until it started to rain and the rain was coming in on the computers, but we worked around it. Um, I did have one URI student that worked at a hospital. So I assumed they were having COVID tests all the time. So I said, do you have a recent COVID test? She said, no. I said, well, could you get one to go into one of my facilities? They had just become COVID free. They finally had opened back up to visitation. Uh, she had her COVID test. She came to my house. She said, my COVID test was negative. I said, great, tomorrow we're gonna meet here. Um, and of course, we went to every single unit because I wanted, you know, to do as much as we could while we were there. And I introduced her to everybody. And um, the next day, she got a call, contact tracing, to say she had COVID. And she said, "No, they called me and said I don't have COVID." And they said, "Oh, well, you do." <laughs> oh so I had to call this facility that I had only been going to for a couple of months, and they had to shut everything down, every single unit. They had to close to visitation. Um, it, was, it was a horrible phone call to me. And it was not her fault at all. Um, and then their answer was, well, why did you have her have a COVID test? I'm like, I thought I was doing the right thing. You know? <laughs> right, right. Oh my goodness. I, I can only imagine. I mean, I think about that too, because when I'm going into rotations, I'm so fortunate that I've been in person for all of mine, but I'm like, worried that something like that's going to happen, but I've been lucky yeah. so far. <laughs> yeah, good. I, I yeah, hope it stays that way. But um, 
and now you guys are being tested, I think, bi-weekly. So yeah. Yeah. That's, so that's helpful. And and the testing's so prevalent now, it's so easy to to get yeah. testing. Back then it wasn't so easy and it was taking a very long time. Right. Um so anyway, so you know, some of my facilities have been hesitant to have the students in them, but we've really worked around it. You know, even that we've been able to um you know, give the students some good quality. Um, I, I, I give them an option. I've been vaccinating with Walgreens for, um, I think you know from our call that we did, but um, so I'm working my full-time job and then I'm vaccinating about 40 hours a week. So my life is a little crazy and I tell the students right up front, so you could stay in the pharmacy for all five days, that's fine. I, no problem for me. But if you want to kind of see what we're doing, then you have to just bear with me. And my current student, um, Walgreens was back and forth. And I said to her on a Monday that, okay, Tuesday, I'm definitely going to be available. So I'll be able to do your orientation. I'll be able to work with you on Zoom. And then Monday night at seven o'clock, Walgreens called and said, okay, you're all set to go. Can you do a clinic tomorrow? <laughs> so I think I texted her at 9.30 at night and said, so either you could work in the pharmacy tomorrow or do you happen to be free tonight for a few hours? <laughs> and I said, you don't, you know, pajamas are fine, it's okay. <laughs> so we did a Zoom call. She, she has been so incredibly flexible. We did a Zoom call for two hours um, late. I think her roommates were like, who is this crazy woman having you do this? <laughs> and then the next day I'm like, okay, I'll be available if you have any questions. Kind of gave her a little summary and, and of course she texted me, but I was vaccinating people's arms. I couldn't take my gloves off and wash yeah. my hands and then pull out my phone. <laughs> so, so we had to work around that. Um, but she has been so flexible. I, I just so flexible. One Friday night we were in a facility. I really wanted her to see an assisted living and how they do it all on paper because this home is all paper still. And I had a, a COVID clinic there with Walgreens. So I said, well, do you want to come in? And then she had an interview and the timing didn't work out. So I said, well, why don't you come after the clinic? So we were there from like 6.30 to 9.30 at night on a Friday night. Wow. <laughs> so she was, again, but part of what, you know, I'm trying to teach them is the flexibility in this job as well. Yeah. She had a interview for a residency and I was like, nope, go do the, go do the, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just go do that. It's fine. We'll work on this later. Yeah. So the flexibility of this job has been really, um, I would say the best thing about consulting is the flexibility. Yeah, that's and cool. that we get to do great things for people and change their lives and all right. of that. But well, personally, it's the flexibility, it's being yeah. able to go on vacations. Definitely, that's important. Um, so those are all the questions I had. Did you have anything else that you wanted to add that I didn't ask or we didn't talk about? You know, I love working as a consultant pharmacist. I, I, I truly do love my job. Um, oh, when do I work? So what time do I work? What's my schedule look like? Um, when the sun rises, I usually get up. And it, that varies when that is. And I get up and just start working because uh, long-term care facilities are open 24 seven. And if you're doing something online, it's also available. I do like to go in on off shifts. I don't have to, but very often I may take the day off if it's a summer, maybe I'll go to the beach and then I'll work in the evening and I get to do med passes with the evening um, med techs who usually don't know who I am and are wondering what I'm doing there. <laughs> um, I have been known to be there at five o'clock in the morning so I can do change of shift narcotic audits and see the 11 to 7 shift and when they give the alendronate with, you know, a house supplement. Um, then we let them know why they can't do that. So I could work a nine to five job. I could very easily work this job as nine to five, but I tend to flex those hours significantly and work, you know, all sorts of different hours, which is wonderful. Yeah, that's awesome that you're able to do that. Yeah, and I really like, you know, Farm America has been very good to me. Uh, the people in the Warwick Pharmacy are so supportive. We're actually... Uh, separated so there is the dispensing pharmacists and they're you know in the chain of command i guess going up and then there's consulting which has a whole different my boss is out of pennsylvania 
Um, and I, you know, I think she's been my boss for um, five, six, seven, eight years. And, you know, maybe I've seen her 10 times in person because she has a very large territory. Um, but you're able to work very autonomous, you know, as long as you're doing your job. A lot of it has to do with regulations, with the Department of Health, with uh, federal regulations. So we have to stay on top of those, um, making sure they're not giving meds together, uh, dignity issues, making sure they're not passing meds during mealtime, unless that's how the patient wants it. And um, a lot of medications on the beers list, medications like antipsychotics. Someone could go to a hospital and be there for a uh, psych admission. They get them stabilized on meds. They come to a long-term care facility and the regulations say, oh, wait, you have to try to reduce their dose of their medications and get them off that PRN antipsychotic. And oh, they shouldn't be on a long-acting benzo. So we've sent them to the specialist to get them stabilized. They come back to a long-term care facility and we have regulations. So we have to figure out how to work around them for the best outcome for the patient, but also so the facility doesn't get a tag from the, you know, during survey. Yeah, that's tough. Um, so I think that answered. Yeah, you answered, you answered all my questions, I think. So. <laughs> Thank you so much again for doing this. You're very welcome.